Well, good morning. You folks that are watching on video might want to pause this, print out your lesson notes so that you'll be ready when the lesson starts. We didn't have any particular announcements that apply to us today. And uh, Anna is uh, the only one that's, that's a visitor with us today. And you're just, you're a pseudo visitor because you've been here enough. You. <laughs> You mean we're going to lose you? Ah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. It's a pleasure to have you with us. We want to thank all of the group leaders because uh, uh, so far this year we've have had pretty good attendance. Today is not representative of that, but we've had good attendance, and the group leaders have been doing a really nice job of keeping contact with our membership. It, uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that COVID has run its course. We don't know. But it's, it's not really any surprise that Paul stated in Hebrews 10.25, addressing being at church, it says, and this is from the New American Standard, not abandoning our own meeting together, as is the habit of some people, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And that's really spiritual strength and power in gathering together. You, you folks that are regular know that and can testify to that. And Sharon has already addressed the Stone's funeral, but I need to, to share something with you that you may not know, and it's just it's, it's delightful in a time of, uh, of mourning. Uh, Richard got a message from their granddaughter, and uh, Grady passed away the evening of Friday? Saturday. Saturday. Uh, but Mary had gone into a coma about that time, so she had no idea that Grady passed away. Mary passed away the next morning. Now, to some families, that would be a tremendous shock, but their granddaughter put things in perspective that just made me shout with joy that she could look at it that way. She said, Granddad passed away, and he came back to get Grandmother. Now, that's, that's refreshing. Um, along the lines of what the pastor was talking with this morning, have any of you read any of Jonathan Kahn's books? The Harbinger, the Oracle, uh, the Second Harbinger, the uh, Paradigm, they all address scripture, ancient scripture, brought forward to today. Marty and I went to a movie Thursday called The Harbinger's Things to Come. And if you're interested in where America stands in history, you might want to go see that movie. I'm not going to tell you much more about it. It's not what I would call uplifting, but it's extremely educational and informative. Does anyone have anything they'd like to bring up today? Where is that movie? Pardon? Uh, right now it's at, is it Tinseltown in Grapevine? Is that the name of it that's close to uh, the Chevrolet dealership? That's the only one I know of. You can, you can get them uh, tickets online. It's it's kind of it's kind of funny. It's Tinseltown in in Grapevine, but my uh, Marty ordered the tickets online, and their seating was assigned because they were sold out, and there were a lot of invisible people there. <laughs> Harbingers, things to come. And it's really a documentary put together by Jonathan Kahn. Well, let me tell you about something that I call commitment, and it falls right in line with something that the pastor was talking about this morning. A 2,000-member Baptist church was filled to overflowing capacity one Sunday morning. The preacher was ready to start the service when two men dressed in long black coats and black hats entered through the rear of the church. 
One of the two men walked to the center of the sanctuary while the other stayed toward the back. They both reached under their coats and withdrew automatic weapons. The one in the middle of the church announced everyone willing to take a bullet for Jesus remains seated. Well, at that, the pews emptied, followed by the choir. Then the deacons ran for the door, where they were followed by the choir director and the assistant pastor. After a few minutes, there were only three people left in the church. The preacher was still holding steady at the pulpit. The man who was standing in the center of the church turned around and gently said to the preacher, It's okay, Pastor, you can begin now. We've gotten rid of the hypocrites. Uh (laughs) Jimmy? I I haven't taken one yet. Okay. Everyone have a handout? Fantastic. Well, you know, I always start out with signs. Let me show you a sign that I come up with. How about this one? Y'all recognize this guy? Huh? Whoops, I went the wrong way. Y'all recognize this guy? That's John. That's our, that's our teacher, John. And he's, he's got his sunglasses on, you know, making it look like. They're, they're traveling all over wherever, and they're, they're looking at a lot of Civil War stuff and a lot of presidential stuff and a lot of kind of stuff. And here, here, here's, a, here's a picture they sent for somebody to tell us hello. Y'all recognize who that is? Tom and Carol Cranick. Look at that hat that Tom's got on. Tom, Tom always wears this hat that's about three sizes too small, evidently, but he, he likes it. <laughs> anyway, they're having a great time. John will be back with us next week. All right, here's, here's a good sign right here. I want to be so full of Christ that when a mosquito bites me, he flies away singing, there is power in the blood. <laughs> I love that. That's an old one, but I love, I love that. Here's another one. Life stinks. We have a pew for you. Here's another one. Running low on faith? Stop in for a fill-up. Now here's one that's, that's kind of a list, but we, look at this one. Wrinkle with burdens? Come in for a faith, faith lift. That's kind of like Thessalonians, right? <laughs> here's one. Life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> and we can all say hallelujah to that. Right? <laughs> Dog, spelled backwards, is man's best friend. Isn't that, isn't that good? Y'all got that, right? Here's one. Eat here and get gas. <laughs> What he's actually saying is he, he does multiple things, right? He has a restaurant and he also has a gas station. Are you sure, Jimmy? Yeah. But I'm not sure. That's Indiana. Who knows what happened in Indiana? Now, here's, here's some buzzards. These buzzards, you know, even buzzards give grace. Have you noticed that? Look what they say. Lord, bless this meal and the trucker who prepared it. Pray that they don't start a blessing before they see you. Okay. Yeah. Here's my here's my here's my serious one for the day. When God writes your name in the book of life, He does so in ink, not in pencil. Isn't that great? I don't know about you, but my name is written in the book of life in ink. Here's yours. I hope so. All right. All right. We're going to review a little bit. Uh, last week. Richard began our study in 2 Thessalonians. And Paul had sent Timothy to check on these new Christians and found that there were some concerns with the new congregation. You know, Paul was there just a few weeks and had to leave because of the uh, Judaizers and all those people running him off. And so when he got, when he got to Corinthia, Corinth, he wrote them a letter 
he taught them for about two or three weeks, and then he wrote them a letter and explained, oh, that's where 1 Corinthians come in. And then Paul had heard some things going on, so he sent Timothy back to see what's going on. And Timothy come back with a list of things that, were, a few things were going on, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. There were some troublemakers that had claimed authority as teachers and were creating confusion. This prompted Paul to write another letter to remind his friends in Thessalonica of the truths he had shared with them. In chapter 1, Paul gives, a, gives them a warm greeting and he gets right to the point. He explains what will happen to those that persecute the church. In verse 7 through 9, Paul tells it like it is. When the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven and his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And here, here's a powerful, that, that is a very powerful of the, of the gospel to be, to be uh, uh at the end, in the end times, when, when God calls everyone, you be, to be, if you be, are sent to hell, you are going to be separated from God. Let me, show you what, let me show you what Charles Spurgeon said here. The absence of God represents hell's most excruciating torture. Isn't that good? In other words, the absence of God is hell. All right. Then Paul gives an encouragement that is, that is for individual Christians as far as in, in the church also. He says in 11, verse 11 through 12, this is a common New Testament truth that we see all through the New Testament. We are only worthy to be called his because of undeserved grace and mercy. Right. Amen? Right. And our honor is to walk by faith and power. And the source of power comes from our, through our being in his presence. And the result of being that result being that the Lord Jesus would be glorified in us. Okay? So that's, that's chapter 1. Now we're going to get into chapter 2. And chapter 2 is going to be a little bit different. We're going to be looking at the end times again. Now let me, let me tell you something, folks. You, you know this. When you start talking about the second coming and end times, there's, there's a lot of dis, uh, discrepancy, not discrepancy, a lot of... Uh, interpretation differences. Let's put it that way, right? And we heard one interpretation from the pulpit today, and, and we're going to hear another interpretation today in, in, from, uh, in 2 Thessalonians. I'm not saying that either one of them is wrong or either one of them is exactly correct. What I'm saying is when we start looking at what the Bible says, you, you interpret what the Bible says in your own life and you judge it for yourself, okay? So I'm going to be interpreting what, what 2 Thessalonians 1 through 12 says today about the second coming, okay? And let's go from here. Verse 1 through 4, read. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or troubled by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from me. Let no, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come until the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. He will exalt himself and divide, defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Okay, so Paul, Paul's giving them a pretty good warning there. It appears that the Thessalonians had become unsettled by a teaching that allegedly they said was Paul's, that the day of the Lord Jesus Christ had come. False teachers claiming to be speaking to, for Paul had caused the Thessalonians to be shaken in mind and troubled. Their fears centered on the idea that the day of Christ had already come. They were upset at the idea that somehow they, they missed the rapture and they were now going to face tribulation. Okay? Now, I, I, I was reading this. These, these, young, these are young Christians. And they were listening to some false teachers. And Paul wasn't there any longer, so 
they, the, the only teachers they had to listen to was these false teachers. And Paul uh, had left after about a, two, a couple of months of teaching only. So these guys were new Christians and they were excited for the Lord. We found in 1 Thessalonians they were excited about the Lord. But here they are with people coming in with, with the different, different uh, trans, translations of, 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 of the, the word and everything so forth. And causing a lot of trouble for them, in other words. We thought this and now we think this. But let me tell you what. When we read, when we read about the rapture, which we're fixing to do in a minute, what was the what was the beginning of the rapture? What was the very beginning? Remember? Was it a loud noise from an archangel? Was it a trumpet of God? How could you how could you miss that? Huh? Yeah. How could you miss that? Okay, so these, these guys were worrying from, from false teaching, but they knew in their head that the, the, the rapture wasn't coming until they heard this, this, this shouting and, 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 and thrum from the Lord, okay? So that, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. How do we in this room, I'm assuming that most of you guys are fairly mature Christians because we're up in age, and we've been going to church a long time. We've been studying the Word a long time. Most of you probably have an individual relationship with the Lord, okay? So let me ask you a question. How do you know that the rapture hadn't already come and we missed it? How do you all know that? Yeah, we're here studying it, right? We're still here. We're still here. So it has not happened yet. Okay? Let me, let me assure you of that. All right? And when it happens, we're going to hear it. We're going to hear about it first, right? It's going to be loud. Okay. Now, Paul begins in verse 1 by saying he wants to clarify some things about the coming of our Lord, Jesus and mainly how we will be get together to meet him. Now, this is, this is, where, this is where we saw this in, first, in chapter, chapter 1. Paul is implying, and he says later on, he says, don't you remember what I told you? Well, he's he kind of doing the same thing. He explained to them. He says, let me, let me show you what I explained to you in my first letter. And this is, this is uh, 1 Thessalonians 13 through 17. Let, watch this. He says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of the God. It's going to be plain when he comes, right? It's going to be plain. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I don't know about you, but ever since we studied this, and this, this verse, this, this passage was presented to me, it has comforted me the whole time. I'll guarantee you. If you've lost someone, this this assured, this is God's promise. This is God's promise that they're going to be like like Grady did, come back and get married by the hand and take you up. And I and I know that one of these days, Pat's going to come and get me by the hand, and we're going to go. We're going to meet up there, and then we're going to meet Jesus, and then we're going to be with Him forever. Okay. Now. Some of the controversy sometimes is how we determine, how we interpret as what that's going to be. Okay? So we're going to look at that today. David Jeremiah, in my opinion, is one of the best teachers of the second coming. If you've ever read any of his books or go on his website and look at things, he, 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 he interprets the way I think. Okay? He interprets the way I believe and the way I think. Let me show you something. Let me show you how he interprets First and Second Thessalonians. Look at, look at this. The rapture and the second coming. Here, let me, here, first of all, he, he says it's two parts of one great event. Let me tell you what, I mean, what he means by that. The first part is the rapture where Christ returns for his church. And the second coming, the second part is the, coming, the second coming of Christ and Christ returns with his church. Does that make sense? Okay. 
This is, this is all one, but, but we don't know how far apart those are except the, th the, the seven years of tribulation, more or less, okay? So, now, what we're going to be reading today is, is that uh, Paul says there's certain things that have to happen before we get into the tribulation. Now, folks, you understand that we've been in tribulation for a long time, okay? This is a special tribulation we're going to be going through called, called the... Uh, uh, I forgot what it's called. It's called the tri tribulation, but there's two parts of it. There's a, there's a tribulation and there's a great tribulation. It's even worse. Okay? We're going to be studying about that in a little bit. Now, what we're going to be studying today is there has to be certain things that happen before the tribu this tribulation in the Bible happens. And, of course, what, what, what the, what's the first one? Well, what the first one we see is Christ returns for his church, the rapture. Okay? Okay. Now, I put this up here because what we're going to read now, if you'll, if you'll, if you'll follow me with, when we read this and we uh, instruct what we're doing, if we, if we go by this chart right here, it'll, it'll make you understand because everything's going to be happening after the rapture of the church, okay? Acar according to him. Now, verse 2, don't be easily shaken or troubled by those who say the day of the Lord has already begun, Okay? Don't believe them. Don't be fooled by what they say. Paul doesn't want the Thessalonians to be frightened, but, but he wants them to comfort, be comforted by reassuring them of the future hope that's in the gospel. Let me tell you what, folks. Richard and I had a talk. We have garage talks every once in a while. He comes to my garage, and we sit in the garage, and we talk about stuff. And uh, uh, Most of the time we lie about stuff, but I mean, we talk about <laughs> we do talk. We do talk about Scripture a lot. We do. But we don't lie about that. <clears throat> and we both agree that that part, say, that, that, part that says, uh, I don't you be ignorant about the, about the coming of the Lord. I don't you be ignorant about the second coming. If, if that part, if, it, 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 it was all we knew. If, if that part was all we knew, that Christ is coming and taking you with him, if that's all we knew, that would be enough. All this other stuff that we understand from Daniel and all these places, I mean, you know, it's hard to interpret all that. And we heard a, a good interpretation from the pastor today, and, and uh, we're going to hear some, some other, other parts that kind of is a different interpretation. So the main thing is, is you study your, your word of God and, and you interpret for yourself what you're going to believe, okay? It's all true. It's just different interpretations. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come until the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Paul explains that the day of the Lord, tribulation, will not begin until these two events happen. First, apostasy. Now this is a big word, and uh, it's a Greek word. You see the Greek word there? Bible scholars debate over this. Now, apostasy in, in Greek can mean three different things. Rebellion, or it can mean falling away, or it can mean departure. And in the Greek, Greek translation, sometimes it just, it just comes in, in, out in Scripture as in, interpreted by whoever, but it could, it could go for all three ways, okay? It could go either three ways. So, so some Bible scholars debate whether this is a spiritual apostasy in the church where there's a falling away from the faith just before, just before Jesus comes. There's a falling away of the faith. Okay, that is possible, but I don't see it in the scripture anywhere. That's possible. A rebellion, in other words. Or, here's what some of the other, other biblical scholars say. The physical departure of the church, which is removed in the rapture. Okay? I tend to believe it's saying that the, depart, uh, the departure of the church has to happen before the tribulation begins. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Okay? All right. Now, the revealing of the man of lawlessness, it's not going to happen... The, the revealing of man is not uh, the, man, the revealing of the man of lawlessness is not going to happen until the apostasy comes. In other words, until the rapture of the church, and we're going to be going into tribulation. Now, this is the the man of lawlessness is the antichrist that will usher in the seven year tribulation period when God's wrath is poured out on a world in turmoil. Verse four reveals that he will exalt himself and, divide, and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Now, this, this, uh, 
this interpretation here tells us that all of our speculation about this Antichrist, <laughs> and we say he must be this guy, he must be this guy, must be it. according to this tr interpretation, we will probably not be here when the Antichrist comes. That's going to be in the, in the bad part of tribulation, okay? So, read 5 through 8. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is, is already at work, and only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy the splendor of his... With, let me, and the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Boy, isn't that great? Isn't that great? Key thoughts on that. As God withdraws his restraining influence, the Holy Spirit, in other words, what he's saying, what, what, what this is saying is when, when, the, when, the, when the rapture happens and the, and the church is, is, is taken out of the world, the Holy Spirit is also taken with them. And it's given over to Satan and this, and this uh, anti-Christ guy, okay? The reveal. And lawlessness is, it says lawlessness is already at work. This great principle of evil is already present in the world system. It will be immediately revealed, it will be ultimately revealed in the Antichrist. We see lawlessness at work right now, don't we? I mean, we see lawlessness at work. We can actually see it, but we're not in the tribulation yet. So, so tribulation doesn't only include this, it just includes the work of Satan as a prince in the power of the air, and the ruler of the world system, okay? It's happening already. But when this Antichrist comes, I mean, it's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad, evidently, from what I understand. Okay? Now, Paul states two certain facts about the man called the lawless one. It is certain that the lawless one will be revealed when the Holy Spirit removes his restraint. Now, nobody knows, nobody knows. We said this already. Nobody knows this time when the church is going to be raptured from the earth and the Holy Spirit is removed. Nobody knows this time. It's a set time by God, and even Jesus doesn't know when it's going to be. So we're, we are waiting on that, and we've, we've, we've learned a lot of things we're supposed to be doing while we're waiting. We're going to look at it just a minute, too. It is certain that the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be destroyed by the mere breath and brightness of Jesus at his coming. Now, that, that is going to be glorious, and, uh, and we're, going to be, we're going to be watching that when we're when Jesus come with the church. We're going to be experiencing that ourselves. Okay. Now, Robert Morris is another one of my favorite preachers, and he's also really good on the end times. Okay, Sometimes he's a little harder to understand than, uh, than uh, David Jeremiah is, but here's what Robert Morris says. I, I love this. Have you ever blown a small piece of lint off your shoulder? I thought of this when I was reading 2 Thessalonians 2, which describes the Antichrist the lawless one, who will exalt himself as ruler of the world, claiming he's God. He will be the supremacy of evil and worldly power. But listen to verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed through, the, through whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Listen to what he says. Our Jesus will overthrow the Antichrist like blowing a piece of lint off his shoulder. And Christ's splendor alone will destroy him. This is Jesus coming on the white horse, is where this is, right here. And he, here's what else he says Christ is the Lamb of God, but we dare not underestimate the power of our Lord. If you want a glimpse of the glory, power, honor, and supremacy of our Lord, take a moment and read about his coming in Revelation 19 11 through 16. That's, that's when he comes with the church. He's on white horses, and the church is on white horses, and, and Jerry, Jerry Sanders is on one of those white horses. Y'all you know, remember that? Jerry used to say, when, when I die, I'm a, God's going to uh, uh, give me a horse, and I'm going to start taking care of him for this time to come back. 
And he's up there taking care of that horse right now. You know, that's funny. Pat doesn't like horses, but he, she's got one now. <laughs> that's going to be interesting. Verses 9 through 12, read. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion, and they, will, they should believe in the lie that they should all be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, this, this passage here tells me that, that why people go to hell. And, it's, and you know, I've heard that why does people send, God send, send people to hell? Well, according to this, he doesn't. It's, it's not God's plan, but their unbelief of the love of the truth is what sends themselves to hell, right? Okay. Now, let me, let me have a little application here. These, these Christians, in, in a, we're talking about in, in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, are young Christians. They, they haven't been Christians very long. They accepted the word and they loved it. But they were you know, thrown to and forth. Let me show you. Let me show you what what Paul told the, the Ephesian people. This this reminds me of importance. This reminds me of an important growing mature as a Christian by knowing the Word and knowing who you are in Christ. Okay, Paul shared this with the Ephesian Christians. Ephesians four, twelve through fourteen, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then, listen, to, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Okay? In other words, when, you, when you're a baby, Paul, Paul they call these people baby Christians that had to be fed on milk and could not be fed on the word, solid food. So as you grow as a Christian, you should become so mature that you can understand the teachings, the false teachings of people. Have you, have you, seen, have you seen something sometimes where a preacher, mainly, mainly these television preachers, I mean, if you watch the television very much, some of these guys have great messages, but their underlying schemes are, show up. And the Holy Spirit in you can say, that's not right. That's a good thing because you not only recognize that that's wrong, it, put, it, it moves you back to the Word to check it out for yourself. See what I mean? So that, those, these, new, these new Christians in, in, in the church of Thessalonica didn't have that maturity yet. So that's why Paul's doing all this. Okay? And John, 3, here's, here's, here, John 13, 16, 13 says, The Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. Okay. Last page. Let me read to you what Swindoll wrote. As saved saints, we are not appointed to wrath and will not be here when the Antichrist is revealed. But we have a solemn task ahead of us as we occupy ourselves in the things of God until the Lord Jesus comes to take us to be with himself. Let us continue to deepen our knowledge and understanding of the word of truth. And let us earnestly share a knowledge of that truth with those that are lost in their sins so that others may, be, may, be, may not be snatched by the teeth of the enemy before the great and terrible day of the Lord. When seven years of God's wrath will be poured out on a Christ-rejecting world, and then the day of the Lord will continue for a further 1,000 years during Christ's millennial reign, on earth as he as he rules as king of kings and lord of lords. Okay. In this passage, Paul tells us the end from the beginning. We may not understand all this symbolic language and everything, but here, here's the whole ending of the lesson right here. The good news of 2 Thessalonians 2 is that God is on his throne and we are in his hands. Okay. You understand that? 
I personally believe what I taught here today. Other people believe that there's there's a there's a pre-trib, post-trib, and mid-trib, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And Richard said there's a pan-trib. It'll all pan out in the end. Okay. So the thing is, is get to know your the word. Make sure that you're in that group of people that's going to be taken up <laughs> by the Lord in the rapture. And wh whether we have to go through the tribulation or not, God's on his throne and we're going to take it. We're going to be there. Uh, the people that I've been studying from say we're not going to be go going through the tribulation, but we need to be ready for anything. You understand that? Okay. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to do this today. Uh, here's, my, here's my ending. I am blessed, chosen, adopted, accepted, redeemed, and forgiven. Are you? Amen. Amen. Lord, let's pray.